All right, everybody. Hello, this is Bob again. And uh, as you can see here, we are going to be looking at the Warlord number one. But this isn't the original Warlord number one that came out in the 70s. This one apparently came out in 2009. And I did not know that. So I remember as a kid uh, having comics that my mother had bought. I'm sure I said this in other videos. She would buy random comics from some um, someplace, uh, garage sale or something like that, and bring it home. So I had just this extremely wide uh, arrangement of comics that was just weird because it wouldn't just be superhero stuff. You'd see the one I have on uh, my Aram, and I had some Cerebus comics in there, you know, that uh, weren't really made for kids. But here I am at six or seven years old reading those comics, um, you know. Things like that, you know, along with having like uh, Green Lantern and and who and Spider Man and all of that. Uh, so I had issues of the Warlord, uh, but in those issues, I remember reading it and loving the artwork as a kid. I was just like, you know, this is awesome. I, I was always into fantasy adventure. That's my primary thing uh, that I'm into. You know, I was a big Dungeons and Dragons fan and everything, and uh, that's what this book was. But it always seemed to me that the guy, the warlord himself, came from Earth, but I didn't know exactly, like, the whole thing. I didn't have many issues that, like, told you the entire origin or anything like that. Um, you know, but it, it resembled, like, Conan the Barbarian enough for me to get into. Uh, so, uh, of course, later on, I'm collecting a lot of the old warlords. I've got a gigantic stack of warlord over here that I was, I'm reading through. And, um... I was going through a dollar box one day and I came across Warlord here, um, one and two. I don't have two right here with me. I thought I did. Uh, but I was like, oh, okay, Warlord one and two. Awesome. Uh, why are these in a dollar bin, right? Then I'm like, oh, it came out in 2009. What the hell is this? I didn't know that they had like relaunched it or whatever. But I was like, I want some Mike Grell art. I love Mike Grell. The, the artwork on Warlord was just amazing. So I'm going to go ahead and pick these up. And, of course, uh, he doesn't draw the book. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, fuck, come on, man. This I bought it for literally one reason, and that was micro artwork. You get his artwork on the cover. Uh, you're not getting the artwork inside here. So, basically, what we have is we have uh, some archaeologists or whatever on an expedition here uh, who find a frozen dinosaur in a cave. Um, and this is the artwork that we get, which is wild because this to me looks like something from, uh, early image and not from the founding fathers, but at the time when they were taking in any talent that they, uh, saw something in, but before those people had become the artists they are today. Okay. So, you know, looking at the, the stiff faces here, the stiff poses and everything that's what I'm getting from it not to mention uh there's just a thing where it's like um if the inking is uh too smooth or something like that or if, if people are trying to be a little too perfect with it like look at the tiny tiny little razor sharp teeth that they had to put in here so perfectly um when you do that it tends to take away from something right like, the imperfections are usually what are adding some kind of uh, detail or texture or something like that to the to the image. Um, all of these, like, you're not getting line weight with anything. It's like they used a, uh, a micron or something like that to ink with. And without the line weight, you lose a lot. So, like, you have very thin or you have a very thick, perfect blotch of, of ink, right? It doesn't work. Uh, it just, it never works. You know, here's the detail, but that's the same thickness as the outline and the wrinkles and such. And, you know, that's just, it's always been a thing that has bothered me so much. Unless you're going to be doing a lot of cross hatching here or whatever, which they're not doing. Like, you're not getting that. You're either getting this solid, solid black or you're getting just this thin line here uh, of an outline. It just, I'm sorry, it just doesn't work, right? So I have to say, going through this, the artwork was a bit of a disappointment. It's serviceable. It's not the worst artwork I've ever seen. It just really didn't do much for me at all. Uh, this picture doesn't seem very dynamic. Um, 
you know, the things that we have here, again, these people look stiff. Uh, but anyway, it appears that uh, somebody is talking to a Lara Croft type uh, and telling them, you know, uh, where they had found this uh, dinosaur or whatever because they want to go back. Um, not much here, uh, you know. It, it's basically just, you know, them trying to find out, you know, put together an expedition here or whatever. Here we have uh, this other guy who apparently is a scientist as well. Uh, and he was here breaking like this, uh, the sound barrier or whatever in um, a vehicle that he designed. He meets uh, the Lara Croft woman from earlier, uh, whose name is Bonnie Kate. Um, and she's telling him about, you know, where they have to go. This is the other woman that was contacting her. And then I guess he's letting somebody else know because basically they're just building a team in order to go on this excavation, uh, which I think was up Mount Everest, okay? Um, and we all know that's, you know, a, a big one or whatever. Uh, as you can see here, it looks like that, uh, I, what is it? They said they had to get, uh, they had to be careful going up this mountain because it's right next to like a Chinese uh, military camp and they don't want to get ca uh, captured. But of course they stopped to take a look and of course knock down snow and everything. Uh, so that they start getting attacked by these soldiers. Uh, so they run away and into a cave. And it just so happens to be the cave that has uh, these frozen dinosaurs and such in it. Okay. Um, this person, I think, starts an avalanche in order to take out the Chinese soldiers. Uh, which apparently works. And as they venture deeper into the cave, they come across what looks like a portal. Okay. Okay. Uh, looks like, you know, some kind of portal. We have a lot of, you know, glowing rooms here and such. Uh, and it just seems to me that everybody is like, oh, well, a glowing portal, you know, it's kind of what we expected. So we're just going to go ahead and walk through it. Um, this is a DC comic. In the DC universe, there are many, 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 many superheroes. Uh, so no one should ever be surprised at anything that ever happens anywhere. Right? Like, all the magic is is there. There are magical superheroes. They've seen this. You know, people read this. No one should ever be shocked or stupefied by anything because it's all normal place here. Um, so they're just like, you know, well, we're going to go ahead through it, which they do. And now we cut to the story of Travis Morgan, uh, the warlord. Uh, now, it has been um, updated, the story. Uh, basically, Travis Morgan was... A test pilot or not a test well yeah he was a test pilot military pilot uh in the air force and he was flying um a stealth bomber uh in order to get information on russians uh but apparently they uh spotted him fired him he loses control his navigation system doesn't work now i think in the original uh origin which i have he flew his plane around a curvature of a hole that takes him underneath the Earth's crust. And that's where you end up in what was originally called Tartarus, but then was changed to Scartarus. Okay. Um, it's a little weird. And I never looked up why that had to be changed because as far as I know, Tartarus is a, uh, is a mythological land to begin with. So there can't be copyright or anything like that on there. Uh, but they ended up changing it to Scartarus, and I think it has something to do with maybe it clashed with some other DC comic that was using Tartarus at the time. Uh, but anyway, that lies under the crust of the Earth, right? And it's a whole world. And I say the Earth's core is like a burning sun. And uh, that's what provides the heat and the light there. And it's an eternal sun, so they don't have any daytime because they're not revolving around something uh, and they're not spinning. You know, it's spinning with them. And it's constantly there. So also, time runs differently uh, there. You could be there for years or whatever, and it would just be a few days on Earth, uh, or on the, the actual Earth, like the upper crust. Uh, but here, he gets shot down, ejects, and as he's flying down, he must have flew through the hole that takes him to the land of Scartarus. Uh, as you can see here, it is a, you know, heavy vegetation there are dinosaurs um he becomes the warlord okay and uh 
he gets a companion that is literally a cat who can turn into a human form. Not a human that can turn into cat form. She's a cat, okay? Uh, and that is your origin story for Travis Morgan, okay? Uh, so Travis apparently gets attacked immediately after waking up by a griffin, uh, because that is the life of the warlord, okay? Uh, everything is a danger in Scartarus, and you have to be, you know, be able to handle it to, to live, and that's what made the warlord so great. Um... So, uh, now in the, in the original comics, the Warlord had an upper hand every time he got into a battle. He had a gun. He had some of the stuff from his airplane when he crash landed. He didn't abandon the plane. He actually landed it. So, some things were there. Uh, so, he had some ammunition. He had a gun. He had, you know, his, uh, his clothing, his weapons and such. Um, so, when Extreme Danger came around, there were times he used that gun. And then people were afraid of it, of course. And, you know, would either release him or follow him uh, like he was some kind of leader or god or something like that. Uh, but it does not look like he has that gun anymore. So he um, is fighting this griffin, ends up killing it, cutting its head off, right? Presenting it to the people who come rushing in like, oh my god, is there danger? And they're like, why are you even worried about me? I'm the warlord. I can you know, I eat these griffins for breakfast, literally, so go ahead and fry this up and, and we'll have some, right? Um, so she, you know, he, he goes out into his village where uh, this guy here, his name is Tinder, is telling him the story of somebody who uh, got hurt and uh, this person wheeled that person in and he says that, you know, he got hurt by something that had the power of, like, many spears. Uh, and Warlord is like, okay, that's impossible. Nobody has that kind of uh, stuff here in Scartarus. And he's like, well, you need to see it because there's a hole in him, but there was no spear uh, to see or anything like that. So when they present him to him, it's a guy with a gunshot wound, and that's a gunshot that went through some Kevlar. And he's looking at this Kevlar, and he's like, okay, I know exactly what this is. Now, I need to say that, as I was just explaining about Scartarus. Uh, now, again, I have not read every Warlord issue, but I've read a lot. And the Warlord, um, again, Scartarus, time runs... Uh, uh, if you spend a couple years... Or no, I'm sorry, it's reverse. If you spend a couple of days in Scartarus, it ends up translating to like years in uh, the real world, on the above world. So uh, there were times where he went back to the above world. He was able to go back there and it was the future. You know, there were, there were things that happened and everything uh, because time runs slower in Scartarus than it does. They're kind of making the people there almost immortal because they can live for so much longer. Uh, so it seems weird to me because this story would have to take place um, way before a lot of the other stories took place in the Warlord. So, I don't know. I think that's weird, but it is written by Mike Grell. Mike Grell's the guy who wrote all of the other Warlord issues, so he's the one who knows the Warlord better than anybody else, and he would definitely know it better than me. Uh, it's just, unfortunately, this Warlord comic did absolutely nothing for me. Um, it was the Warlord. Uh, usually, when you get a Warlord comic you're getting most of the story right there. Like a, a storyline may progress for two issues or three, but it doesn't progress for much longer. You can get in and, you know, read it and get a complete story for the most part. Um, you're kind of not getting that here. Like, like almost nothing happened. Some people formed a team to go look at some frozen dinosaurs or whatever, found a portal and immediately walked through it. And then we cut to the warlord where we get, uh, his origin, which has been updated. And then, um, they bring a guy who's been shot. Okay, uh, so I'm thinking this is more along the lines of they're probably doing like a soft reboot of a lot of the stuff. Uh, but I have to say that it didn't uh, really do much for me. And then we can see here we have a uh, Power Girl um, comic here. Uh, I don't know. This one's not doing it for me art wise. I did not read it. Uh, there was nothing there that was uh, that was grabbing me. Um, but, okay, so I can see why this comic did not last long. Um, I don't know how many issues this ran with, but uh, 
yeah, I will go back to the original. So anyway, uh, this was The Warlord. I want to thank you guys for watching. If you liked the video, please hit like. It helps my channel grow. If you want to see more videos like this, hit subscribe. Thank you.